All right, folks. Um, Chris, it was before we clicked the record, but if you were to do exactly what you just did, which was quite funny, you'd say what? And a one, and a two, and a chickafuma well, chick. Chickafuma? Is that what you said? I don't know the word. Chickabuma. Chickabuma. Chick. Yes. Uh, in, in, in other words, Chris has listened to a podcast episode or two because he's like, if we're counting down, the music's got to be happening, but you're getting a feel for the for the behind the scenes of it. Turns out it's not live right there. Bailey just works her magic. Oh, there's a little intro. I don't even know what she does. She just makes it happen. It's wonderful. Um, so I have uh, guests here today. Um, we have Chris and Tim from Contento Co. Contento Co. Nailed it. It's a little bit of a tongue twister. Um, Contento Co. They're in East Aurora, uh, New York, outside of uh, the big city of Buffalo. We'd already talked about the snowfall and how how the Buffalo Bills Stadium gets filled for the playoff games. They also seem to be trending in not a good direction, gentlemen. I don't know if you're Bills fans over there, but all of a sudden they were like, ooh, they're going to get their day and they're going to win the title. Um, and now I'd rather be a Lions fan than a Buffalo Bills fan. What say you? We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. And Jared Allen, and, and is it Jared Allen? That's Josh. Josh. Josh Allen, we trust. You go. Okay. All right. We'll see. Didn't, didn't you guys just lose your big wide receiver too? Yeah, he 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 didn't do much. To us. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, you like... guys are up. Just saying, if you want to come over to the Lions side, first time in 50, 60 years, it's good to be a Lion. I tried, and they couldn't they couldn't get it done. I guess uh, they were up, right? I yes, tried. I was, I was I was rooting for them. I love uh, Dan Campbell. Yes, they were. They were. Uh, they did have a seventeen point lead going to the second half. Of the That's NFC Championship game, and they did lose. But let's move on to bigger and better things. Like talking about you, gentlemen. Thank you for being a guest on the Remodelers on the Rise show. Um, Chris and Tim are part of the VIP Club, the Foundations Program. They've been in that um, since the start of the year, kind of digging into uh, financials and sales process and all of that fun stuff. How's the VIP Club going, folks? Tim, what do you think, what do you think of the VIP Club, Tim? Kyle, it's been going great. I'd really, really appreciated the uh, the conversations and the insights from the crew and the team, and and yourself and Bailey, and it's been everything we're hoping for. You guys are implementing too. You're like any training, any coaching. You get out of it once you put into it, and you guys come consistently. And you're always looking for all right. What's the nugget? What's the next step? What's the improvement that we can make to this? Um, and that's that's where you guys have been up to. So today today's uh, episode, I want to hear a little bit about. You guys, a little bit of your journey, a little bit of your business, um, and then also kind of um, do most of the the time together uh, with a little bit of kind of a coaching call feel to it, talking about a few areas that you guys are looking to streamline, improve, etc. But if we could start, um, you guys are business partners, and uh, tell us a little bit about your business and also how you guys came together and, and created this company. Sure, I guess I'll start. We. Um... The, the company was born out of necessity when, uh, back in 2018, I had acquired some real estate uh, properties, investment properties, and got to a point where I couldn't work on them myself anymore while still having a W2 job. And I uh, found a guy and, and hired him. Um, some of the guys had done some work on them where else for me. And they were working at a, uh, at the time, he was working at a bubble hockey factory where they made bubble hockey deals. And sounds very uh, buffalo y, by the way. <laughs> When COVID hit, I saw some of their friends were not happy with how things were happening with COVID because it really affected the bubble hockey table market, as you can might imagine. And um, we picked up a few more guys and we had an opposite problem that a lot of people were having, whereas I had a bunch of guys that wanted to work. And so I started talking to the other friends and we were doing small things here and there, mostly in the city for investors. Um, I continued to grow my real estate portfolio, which I grew the company. And eventually we got to the point where we were starting more work in our hometown and getting nicer jobs where we needed more higher skill level of labor and that naturally progressed. And then it's funny, um, I was able to leave my W2 job and it happened to be the same day as Tim. And he sent me a text with his new number and I was like, wow, I was about to send you the same text. And I kind of told him what I was doing and he said we should get a drink together and talked about things and um month later he was fully on board and we did that for the rest of the year and he became a partner. well and tim had you had you guys known each other before did you work together or what was the relationship yeah we did um a couple of different ways uh 
Chris and I work together for a pretty big general contractor in the Buffalo area, actually uh, international general contractor. And I had been there for 17 years. Um, I felt it was just time to start something new and, um, decided it was time to figure out what I was going to do next. Um, but actually a, a number of years back when Chris and I were working with that same company, uh, Chris well, actually bought the same town as I did. And then not only that, his, his backyard and my backyard were neighbors together as uh -huh. well. Uh, he uh, since moved, saw, he saw, moved saw, away to bigger and better homes, but you know, um, he's, uh, but so we've known each other for a while. We've been in touch with kids that are the same age. And, um, so just through the years, uh, there's, you know, Chris and White would say it was, uh, kind of the, or destiny that we all met up again down the road. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, there was this fence company. I saw this sign the other day and it said installing fences for, uh, to keep, to keep, uh, uh, safe your kids, your dogs, and to, um, block your ugly neighbors. That's literally <laughs> what the side of the road said. And I was talking to him. I said, is that, you know, you guys keep that up? He goes, yeah, it's just, we like to have fun. We're kind of laid back. It's part of our culture. We get a lot of positive comments on it. Interesting. But that was not the case for you guys. You guys became fast friends. Um, excellent. So it's been a little over three years. How would you kind of describe your guys' journey over the three years? What what is it what has it been like? How would you summarize that? It's it's been incredibly rewarding when things go right and you have happy customers which test the one consistent we've been able to maintain throughout all of this are incredibly please customers and satisfy them with not only the product, but the overall experience. And that's always been our top priority. And that's no matter cost. So that's financially just doing the right thing, right? We can, with the old, um, the whole saying, you know, we can never go wrong doing the right thing. You can lose a bunch of money doing the right thing, but, um, Man. you know, you call that the cost of tuition and we move on from that. And so that and the thing has been amazing, but figuring out how to run a business and then do a profitability and then providing that business that you can give careers to folks and getting the right people in that it's been a process and we're, we're finally to that point where we have 10 of the best guys you could possibly imagine in the field, um, that we go up against any other company and ones established a lot longer than ours, just from a pure person standpoint and mm -hmm. an individual standpoint. And now it's time where. All the pieces have kind of come together and we're looking to scale slightly in terms of building a showroom and a virtual reality space and getting into some of the design and more of our pre-construction services and actually providing that service for other contractors, and expanding our selections coordination and doing this next step. We saw it exciting and it's like, we almost feel like we're taking some steps back because we're finally getting into a place of comfort. Mm -hmm. But we know we have to be uncomfortable in order to grow to that next level. So you have 10 in the field and then um, in addition to people in the office? Yeah, we have Tim and myself who we both wear a lot of hats, which we realized is a problem. Um, and then my wife who was initially doing some of the HR payroll and, and those two little things, we had brought her on as a full-time selections coordinator. And now we're in the process of hiring uh, two part-time assistants and a, hopefully a full-time project manager. Got it. Hey, Chris, your um, wife might end up listening to this podcast. You want to, you want to give her a shout out at all or? She's, she's surprisingly a rock star. Uh, and I say well, that. that's not the best shout out I've ever heard. <laughs> I mean, it, it was, yeah, try to try it again. Continue on. I say that as my wife taught for 10 years and then, uh, she stopped to stay on with our three youth children and she even had her picking up title and colors for for us, just because it wasn't Tim and I stopped thing to do when she yeah. took it and she's absolutely killing it. And it's been, that's awesome. It's been awesome. Um, so, and I'm not saying there's no way for me to was different, but, um, she's really, I would hire her. So no, it's been, been, agree, but... been a great, you know, Chris and I have said for a while, we, we definitely, there's a different feel when there's, um, women involved in construction and yeah. it, it's definitely, you know, definitely something we wanted to do. It just happened to be. Chris's wife that was the first one we got on board. Um, but you know, she's she's learning a lot about construction, but she's really good at working with people and understanding people and helping them, you know, encourage them to make decisions and she's run into very decisive people, very indecisive people and, you know, she's she's learned as well of, of how to how to work with different type of people all the way through. Um yeah. so she next after she's it, she'll 
have some tools in our tool chest. Even better. So I think that's for, for other remodelers listening to this. As you guys have grown, one thing you realize is, all right, the more work we do in design and project development, the more work we do up front, the more detailed our scope of work is, the more finalized our selections are, the smoother everything is uh, once we start production. So you guys have made some good progress there. And like a lot of remodelers at your stage, it becomes more and more apparent that, oh, if we had somebody that could really help with, I'm looking at what Christina has on her plate of just finishing all of the selections, um, you know, get, making sure they're, they're, you're meeting with the client as, as often as you need. She's helping with some vendor and supplier management, client consultations and communications. Finding that person to take some of those responsibilities off is a really nice next step. And is she full-time or is she part-time? or She's full-time. Um, okay. we still, we, we both, we have an eight-year-old, a six-year-old, a three-year-old, and we self-manage our apartments. We have a mother-in-law that lives with us, and in addition to Bill Perry, I did our other project we were talking about earlier for full-time, so, uh, full, full, full-time spread amongst. But not 95. But yes, understood. understood. <laughs> so that was a big step forward for you guys. So talking a little bit about the, about the financials, just from what we've talked about and we've done some coaching on. You know, your guys' growth from 2021 to 2023 was substantial. Um, and uh, when I look at your numbers and we kind of think about what you guys are working on there, total revenue has been going up, going up, going up. Um, you care to share what it was kind of the last few years? If not, I have it in front of me if you're okay with sharing. Yeah, it was a million in 2022 and two million, a little over two million last year. Yep. With and aims, wow. with aims of getting it up near the three mark this year in 2024. So revenue growth has been has been outstanding. How would you discuss your um, or kind of share with people listening and your guys' experience on how you guys have been approaching marked up and margin and how you guys have been thinking about gross profit? Gross profit being revenue minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit. Talk to me about lessons you've learned on the pricing and the gross profit side of things and where your heads are at. Do you want to say with that? Yeah, so I'd say, I'd say one of the things that we, we really got a better understanding of in the last two years is, is how much is an appropriate amount of markup to get the margins that we need to run our business. And, you know, we came at it and we, we probably felt like marking up something 20 to 25% you know, we should be okay, right? You know, it's 25% on top of our costs and we can take that money and roll it into the bank account and just fund the jobs and fund the company that way. We were some education and uh, golly, you're one of the main sources of that. You know, we realized that that's not gonna be sufficient and there's that markup versus margin discussion that we've had in the number mm-hmm. of is yes, you mark it up, but how much are you actually realizing of that markup, right? Yes. And, and then with that, taking out that the true cost of your business and cost of that overhead and cost of, of running, you know, keeping the doors open for everybody. Um, understanding that we, we weren't charging enough for our work and we had to get out of our own way and understand that it's not worth doing that work for essentially no money. Right. So yeah. you're just, you're just creating problems for yourself. So, so over that time, uh, what we also did is we, we implemented JobFred as our full project management software. Uh, we used it for everything from estimating to budget management um, to job costing and and really embracing all of the information that comes out of that um, has been huge for us to understand where our numbers are and then where they're coming in as job with us. See grippage and slippage on projects to... to have just good, clear insight into that probably being one of the primary financial metrics. Yes. Yeah. And, and understanding, yeah. you know, we've got a target. Yeah. It's great. We've got a target margin for job. And as we've increased them, some of the older jobs that we had estimates for, we can't just tell the customer, oh, we're charging more for margins now, um, even though we had it successful. So we've got to work through some of the older ones, but realizing that, you know, we've got a target and where that variance is and, how it happens is, is huge for us to understand. Yeah. You know, so you, you're you've been dialing up the the total revenue dial um, pretty pretty solidly. But when you guys were kind of you know flirting around with a twenty twenty five percent, let's say twenty five percent markup, all of a sudden that is a twenty percent margin. Twenty five percent markup equals twenty percent margin. So out of that two million dollars. I got my handy dandy calculator here times 0.2. That leaves us with $400,000 of gross profit. 
But the other problem you guys were experiencing, which a lot of remodelers do as well, when we're not watching our numbers, is in addition to maybe not having the markup and margin that we just flat out need, maybe you had some head trash, you had some confidence building of we are worth more, we're going to charge more. But you also, because you weren't watching your job costing, you had some slippage, right? Or man, we need to really fine tune our estimating, our templates, watch that closely. Are we... You know, we estimated X number of hours. Are we actually, you know, hitting those hours? Are we coming in higher and it's eating into our gross profit? I think you guys experienced some of the pain of that and have really worked hard to improve that aspect mm -hmm. of things, which makes a big difference in just the health of the company and also being able to invest and grow on the overhead expense side, right? Yeah, and really, and really also uh, expanding and building out our pre construction process is mm -hmm. starting to show some. Proofs, um, it really will as we get it fully running and operational because the more we can get hard quotes from some trades, the more we can get hard quotes from vendors and have that all in mind versus taking an estimated number and writing a proposal and, and you know, assuming we'll be good and, and you know, taking the other, maybe confidence in the numbers, but the best way to be confident is, is to be 100% sure and, and taking that in mind with it. Um, yeah. So that's, that's really a big part of, of what we've been focus size is trying to spend all that time and investment on the front end versus trying to build it as well lean and, and, and field. And, and what margins are you selling at now? What markup and margins? So we're making sure we, we are at what, 33% markup, you know, as we're clicking it up um, okay. to run 25% margin. Um, you know, and we're just trying to find where the market will bear. That one works for us because we run at about a 14, 15 company overhead based on our revenue is our ideal state right now. Um, as we grow, we know that we're going to have more overhead expenses. We're probably going to have to push that margin up. When the idea at the end of the day, we want to try to leave a 10% profit for Chris and I to split rate. So, yeah. And ideally also in your overhead expenses, have some owner salary already in there as well. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, just even what you're saying there, there's lessons that you guys have learned. There's lessons for people listening to this, you know, paying attention to your gross profit margin, paying attention to your job costing. That $2 million example, the difference between a 20% margin and a 25% margin is $100,000. That $100,000 can go to pay and cover investments you're making in overhead expenses and also enhances what's left at the end of net profit. Um Chris, who's your next hire that you guys are looking at? Uh, project manager. Okay. Uh, now, project manager, are you planning, how do you plan on paying for that person? Are you paying for them out of overhead expense? Are you paying for them out of line items in your proposals and it's more cost of goods sold? How are you approaching that? Uh, increased revenue with not the same amount uh, marginally increases into our expenses and being able to execute, being able to do more with them as on the back end and not having to add fuel staff okay. and, and that sort of thing. Um, what we're, we're hoping they should make us, instead of adding four fuel guys to generate more revenue, we're hoping we can be more efficient in the field and get more things done by, again, not having wasted time and, and non-value-added activities because we're on the back end much more efficient and I like that. So, so part of part of the way you're thinking about how I'm gonna pay, let's pay, let's say this person's gonna be eighty thousand dollars salary just for round numbers. We have some employee labor burden, we're quickly at a hundred thousand. Fair. So yeah. that that hundred thousand, you look at that and you're going, Well, part of that we're going to capture and pay because we're just gonna be a lot more proactive and on top of all of our production side of things. Right. We're, you know, if we're, if we're doing fewer supply runs, if we're doing, you know, more organized scheduling, we'll be able to achieve that a bit there. Um, how else are you going to pay for this person, though, is probably their expense is most likely going to be down in overhead expenses. Is that yeah. true? Yeah. It's not going to be a direct project expense, you know. Okay. Um, would be, yeah. It would be reflected yeah. in our, you know, we probably will. I know. Taking a look at our overall company cost and increasing the bargain, that's how it would cover, but it would be a Bingo. cost. Bingo. And I like where your mind's at with that of going, you know, we don't want to pay for that person just on the fingers crossed of, well, sales will increase and productivity will increase and therefore we'll be able to afford them. Hopefully, yes, those are elements of it, but we also want to take a, a good, hard look at what you were mentioning, Tim, of 
we're just kind of transitioning a little bit from you guys sharing your story into a little bit of coaching, if that's okay. That's well, kind of what we were planning. That's what we were planning on doing. Um, but I made that transition. Um, hopefully, it wasn't too jolting. I was also on a plane last night, and sometimes I'm on a plane and never think about it. Last night it was a little bumpy, and I'm like, "We're just in this tin thing, and it's flying through the air. This is crazy." It was jol- when I said it was jolting. That's kind of how I was feeling last night. And then I needed to stop thinking about it because it kind of freaks you out when you start thinking about it too much. All right. Um, but you're going to look hard at your overhead expenses. If I've got $2 million coming in at a 25% margin, I have $500,000 of gross profit. If my overhead expenses are $400,000, that leaves me with $100,000 of net profit, which is not that 10% goal that you that you guys had. That's only 5%. Right. So looking closely at the numbers, we've got a few different dials that we can adjust the total revenue dial. Yep. But the big one for you guys is continuing to move that gross profit dial up. And frankly, more efficiency, more revenue, um, better productivity out out in the field that should continue to move that gross profit dial up. And then we have an additional expense uh, for the overhead side. So I'd really encourage you to really get clear with exactly what your overhead expenses looks like. And if you're wanting to hire a project manager in the next six months, we need to start charging for that now and perhaps looking at changing how we're pricing you know, our services now versus later, right? When we have that in the budget that we did for 2024 and Good. And we're, we've been budgeting that way, but it also does have the assumption that by hiring this product manager, it's going to free up my intense time to actually do marketing and go out and sell, which right now we, we just, we just flat out don't. It's, it's, it's one, of, one of the hats you're wearing, but it's something you'd like to devote more time to. We don't put any time to it and we've been fortunate so far by word of mouth to make the relationships and the jobs we have had, but we we're very helpful when we actually start marketing the way we want to. So, cool. so those are some financial related items. Another one is just kind of related to partnership. Um, how's, how's your partnership working? How's this thing going, folks? It's good. Me and Tim are opposite from a personality standpoint, but it also bodes well from a partnership. I think if Tim was just like me, we would have dissolved the thing already. But, you know, working with someone who's it's like being married to someone opposite you, uh, it can be frustrating at times on both sides. But overall, if you look at what we've been able to do and build and accomplish, he couldn't have done it without me and I couldn't have done it without him. We definitely have some things to learn and grow. And I think a lot of our frustrations when it comes to our partnership is a lack of processes and definitions of who's doing what yeah. and how those are doing. And that's what we've been working on since getting involved with you on the sleep dial is trying to figure out roles and responsibilities and not just doing what needs to be done. And one thing, one thing we were doing was we were both project managing our own projects mm-hmm. and that became very confusing for the field on a food call. <laughs> you you're know, pulling resources, Tim, you're pulling resources. Yeah. You guys would call me and then I bet no, you got called Tim and Tim that, well, no, Chris knows that answer. And then even the customer communication. And so we, it's been baby steps, but, um, we've been able to clearly define, Hey, Tim handles pre-construction, Chris handles operations, active construction. So that like step one, that really helped has helped things. Um, and then there's still some overlap that we're hoping our project manager might help sure. avoid or selections manager and that's sort of thing. We've been very clear to customers since day one. So that's been helpful. And then, and then Tim, what, what would you add to how the partnership has been functioning? I think, you know, I appreciate a lot of the, uh, the highlights. Uh, I think, you know, it's, it's amazing to me, you know, you look back and it's what we built in a couple of years up from, from where it was in the type of projects that we're doing and the reputation that we have around town. And, you know, it, it from where, you know, a couple of years ago, this was, you know, it was, a, it was always a goal, maybe somewhere down the road, but, um, you know, you, you see, you've got people that you know, all around the village or wherever, or, oh, you got to hire a contentical for your job. You got to hire a contentical for your project. You know, I wouldn't hire anybody else. I'm like, three years ago, we weren't even around or a thing. Right. That, you know, some people have been talking about the project for six years, seven years. We're working with a, we're working with a couple right, right now who are, um, have been playing their house edition in their kitchen for six years and they were waiting for the right people to come by and, and Chris and I were that that crew and it was it's amazing so that i say the it's such a rewarding career and job it's um 
partnership with Penguins I think very well. Like Chris said, there's always there's always moments if they were making millions and it was easy, everybody would do it, right? So there you go. There you go. So a couple couple things that, that come to mind. Um, one is you guys have kind of a breakdown of job duties. It says draft breakdown of job duties. That's a great place to start is just let's let's get this on paper. Let's get this in a spreadsheet. So you have it nice and organized around, all right, Chris, you're doing these things, Tim doing these things. And I think what you guys, there, I see it various ways, but what you just described of being a little bit more siloed where, you know, Tim is in charge of the pre-construction, Chris, you're more in charge of, um, I don't know if you mentioned just production, but having a little bit more of silos where there's not this is usually good for clarity. Um, have you guys ever done a disc profile? I've never yeah. We haven't done them since we've been together, but I've done them okay. as for companies we work for. I, th I think it would be helpful because you mentioned like the personality differences. I think it would just sharpen understanding each other even more. You, yeah. got, you guys are in this for the long haul. So really maybe taking each of you taking a disc and having somebody kind of debrief you on it. Um, Laura Berkey is somebody that I refer. Um, so feel free to reach out and I'll, and she's actually done a podcast with us. Um, but I, I would recommend doing that because I think it'll just sharpen your guys' understanding of how each of you work. Um, you guys are talking throughout the week, you know, oh, we talk every day, but there's a difference between talking every day and talking about things versus really sitting down, maybe even outside of the office to really do kind of a partner meeting and kind of creating an agenda for that. Maybe you guys are doing that, but I'd recommend making sure you have a regular cadence for that. Making sure you guys have an agreement between the two of you to to clear the air if there's anything that's bothering each other. You know, you mentioned kind of the marriage side of things. These best practices are very similar to any long term relationship, right? We better be talking about where we're going. We better talk about how it's going, what's working, what's not going. Making sure that um, that we're on the same page. So I think the clear roles, understanding personalities better, making sure we're we're definitely not harboring anything. We're clearing the air when we have frustrations. And having a set aside proper partner meeting at whatever interval makes the most sense for you guys. I think those are some of those best practices. Um, you know, Dave Ramsey has a phrase of going, the only ship that doesn't sail is a partnership. Dave's smart about a lot of stuff, but there's also some really nice partnerships in the remodeling industry that I that I've seen. You know, and it's really nice when you're able to take a vacation and the other person can step in and vice versa, um, and just be there for each other. It also makes it a little tougher, um, you know, to make some real real money in the business because we need to grow this thing to a larger sales volume, especially in your guys's case um, where you're both kind of off the tools but you're definitely trending in that direction. So there's a few thoughts you'd, you'd wanted to kind of get a couple ideas related to the partnership side. Anything you heard in there that you're going to work on or that you think you're doing well? I think part of the idea of trying to bring on that project manager was to allow Chris and I some more time to be out of being in the business at times and work on the business and work mm -hmm. on our partnership as well and have some time for that. Because um, there is a lot of time where, you know, it, it does get to a point where what I've got going on, what person's got going on, and it's like, it is a bit of a shit's passing in the night at times. Yeah. So yeah. Just, it's hopefully bringing that individual on board will, um, will help with that. Give us, give us some time to set that aside. Yeah, I like that. Chris, what are you looking at? Uh, Son had his, uh, the EOS method sheets, the vision traction organizers and the rats and stuff. Yeah. Uh, it, honestly, I refuse to, I clean my desk a lot and I get, refuse to take these pieces off. They're still blank. They've been out here for about two years since Tim and I did this. And th this is all Tim and I need to do is once every month or once every quarter, sit down and look at our three year picture, our core focus, our 10 year target. And <laughs> it keeps getting pushed to the side of the desk. And that's, that's one thing I think Tim and I can do is have that strictly partnership meeting. Um, yes. And it's just hard because we've got so much going on yep. at work with the kids and like like everyone yep. and then we actually sit down and do the meeting and you're like wow that, that wasn't bad we could have fit right. and it, hel it helps it give us clarity it keeps us kind of motivated encouraged keeps us on the same page so figure out the interval it, it does it does it recommend doing it monthly i believe so i'd have to read the book. yeah Plus. which would which would be amazing but maybe you start by by doing it every other month you know and just realizing that that time is very 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 well spent and that it's very valuable so there, there's a good takeaway from the partner item um the other the other topic you threw out there that you wanted to kind of chat through is you've got a team of 10 out in the field how do we continue to build uh, 
their training? How do we continue to build their technical skills? How do we continue to build their leadership skills? How do we fit training into, um, into our business as well? You see that as an important um, aspect of things, yeah? Yeah, big time. And, and I've kind of had a whole mindset shift since basically for about eight years since we uh, built our house and had our first kid and got into real estate and this entrepreneurship. And so sometimes I feel, feel wow, when I'm talking to the guys, I just go way over their head about mm -hmm. bulls and leadership and all this stuff. And this guy's just like, dude, I just fall on the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I get it. It's not for everybody, right? Not everyone wants to run a business and I don't blame them. Um, we stay is where, where I slash salt and build work, but I do still feel as a company, aside from the construction, we can still help build people. And make people better, which in turn should make us a better company and make this a cool place to work. So when you're done with the whole thing at the end, you can kind of send you know, these people and their families and all that get to where they're going. Yeah. Which I think that's a real big picture and lofty goals. But how can you do that? We can make money more valuable to the company through technical training, efficiency, speed, leadership, negotiation, conflict management. Stuff dealing with customers. Communicate the right communication. And it's like where do you start? And um we we do sit downs and check ins and you know, the guys are doing great, but I some guys are developing on their own because of that type of guy. Mm -hmm. Other guys need us to help develop them. And I'm not a great trainer. Our older are more experienced, are tires, they're great. It's almost We're... like you self corrected yourself there instead <laughs> of calling them older. Uh, the last company I worked for, the technical term was, uh, or the politically correct term was experienced hires. Mm -hmm. Um, they are one, just they're he's the best guy in the world. And he's just like, I'm just, I, I don't know how to teach. And the other one doesn't know how to teach either. Um, mm -hmm. and so they learn by doing, and that's not how they teach. They, they got thrown to the wolves and yelled at and screamed at and figured it out. Um, that's just kind of not the way things happen anymore. And, uh, our guys are progressing, but probably not quick enough to sustain the growth that we want to sustain and, and continue to get better customers and do mm -hmm. higher end work for, and pay the guys more and continue to find the customers that want to pay us the margins we need to make. So, so when you say sit downs and check-ins right now, how are you guys, how frequent is that happening or what does that look like? Or what train or, you know, what team meetings are you having? What does that look like? We meet once a month as a group at the shop and kind of do a rolling update on big picture items and maybe some smaller things that we're doing and some updates on projects and, and just kind of make it a fun, just a fun hour long, get coffee and breakfast and just kind of get everyone together at tech meeting. And yep. in the summer time, we'll do them after, instead of in one, we'll do them in the afternoons and that sort of thing. Um, as far as our one ones, uh, we, we have tons of great material. Um, we just don't. When it comes down to sitting down with the guys and making the time, uh, we'd like to do it every three months quarterly, and it's probably more like close a year. And at that, it's a little bit underprepared. And from the guys on the things, I don't think they see that. Um, I think they're just very appreciative to have sit down with Lutz and I and have some more one time. But from my end of things, I feel like we could be doing such a better job. Yeah. Hey, celebrate. We, we always beat ourselves up about what we haven't done or what we need to do more of. But Tim... The fact that you guys are sitting down even twice a year with each of your team members, let's say that's the case, that's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, but like we said, we'd like to, you'd like to be able to do more, right? Yes. And I just wanted to uh, emphasize that you guys are doing more than a lot of people. That's, that's helpful to hear sometimes, right? Oh, uh, because, you know, it goes, it goes both ways too with it. You know, if the, if the guy's doing good or the guy's not doing well and you want to have him in truth, you don't want it to be either, like, you're only hearing it once a year, right? You want yes. to know. You know, when, when they come around and they're like, hey, how come you give the grades this year? Well, you know, we, we, we've talked about three or four times this year. And how do you think those conversations went, right? Do you, know, do you think it was positive? Do you think there's a lot of things we were working on? And you, do you think you were able to do those? And, you know, it shouldn't be a surprise either way, right? Yeah. And it helps with that. Yeah. So on the, on the leadership topics and the communication and some of those soft skills, not the technical skills, make sure that. Um, maybe after a little icebreaker or something fun, 
try to start your monthly meetings with some specific training before you get into kind of, uh, here's some logistic updates. Here's some kind of, hey, we're having some challenges with our time <laughs> tracking. You get into kind of, you know, hey, we have these projects coming up. Before you get into that, if you save the training for later in an agenda on, a, on your once a month team meeting, it usually doesn't, you usually don't get there. Usually everything else kind of eats it up. Right. So I would recommend kind of being thoughtful with, all right, what is, um, and the other thing I would say is try to make it a little bit more bite-sized. I think, you know, we want we want to kind of teach on this big thing versus, hey, let's talk specifically today. The 15-minute the training here is going to be how do we handle our communication and what do we do when a client is not happy with us? And let's let's use this example. You know, so-and-so, how would you respond to the customer saying fill in the blank? So make it a little bit more bite-sized, I think is very helpful. And make sure you're you're making that part of your once a month group training. So make a little bit of a list of communication of some of the leadership related things. Maybe you get crazy and give them a little bit of homework and say, hey, click on this video. It's a brief little TED talk on this leadership principles by a guy named Simon Sinek. And I want everybody to watch this before our team meeting. And we're gonna start our meeting with discussing this. Some people you'll get a little bit more lift than others. Some people will show up and not even listen to it. That's not acceptable, right? We need to, we need to prep, but make it a little bit more bite-sized and realize you're running a marathon here when it comes to leadership and communication skills. You know, look up some, there's some good production podcasts as well that then you could find little clips from to get people to listen to. Um, so that's more the group based stuff. And then what you're doing with your with your one on ones, so long as you're identifying some areas of strength to encourage them. And so long as you're identifying an area or two that needs improvements and then getting really clear with how they're actually going to improve. You're doing you're doing pretty well there. Continue to fight to maybe instead of every six months, you aim to do three a year, four a year is a lot. When you get a project manager in place, when you get a couple of your other things in place, I bet you, you guys are going to not have much trouble doing it quarterly. Right now, very difficult. Don't beat yourselves up on it and just say, all right, let's set a little bit less of a goal because our capacity to do that is not as high as it's going to be in the future. Does that resonate? Yes. Yeah. And I think the big the big thing um, is, you know, you, you mentioned you bought, um, purchased a five-minute foreman book for all field employees. That's awesome. There's a lot of great training out there. Um, the, the Zangles, who you, you may have seen them in the VIP club a bit, they have they have developed just a full out apprentice program. Like, all right, if you're going to go from an apprentice all the way up in our company, here's how we do. You know, here's we're going to teach you about OSHA. We're going to teach you about measuring and marking. We're going to teach you about hand tools and and materials, dust containment. Proper ways to handle power saws, painting, wall framing. I'm just looking through all of this. Well. It's taken them years to put that together. So um, one, you guys should ask me for that because they're in the VIP club and that should be a nice little perk of being part of the VIP club. Send me a, send me an email and I'll send that to you guys. Um, and then number two, just kind of take it a, a bite at a time, you know, and, you know, start document, just like you documented who's doing what in the company, start documenting some of these, some of this training, maybe even record a little video and just start, start biting away at it. And you're going to look up, in a couple of years and be like, hey, we've got a pretty good little training program going here. There's a few thoughts for you. What are you hearing there? Yeah, we, we try to start off with some motivational or like learning tech our meetings. Like the last one we did was um, the 1% better every day graph, which I think mm -hmm. you with us. And then it really resonated with the guys that like, hey, I know it doesn't feel like you're getting better or whatever, but after a whole year, you potentially according to this math form, it could be 33% better. Or, and this was a great thing about partnership, uh, with Simon's video about the Navy SEALs and the trust versus like the technical ability and how most people want the guy you can absolutely trust, even at a lesser technical ability, which has mm -hmm. about some high higher. You've got really, really, you know, you don't got master craftsmen of sorts, but you got just great individuals that are going to learn. Yeah. I really wanted to show that to one of our guys one day and it's been in that he might be on that other end. And to and stop me, which is probably the right thing. But we also showed him there's a video out there of the Formula One cars and the pit stops over the years and how now it's like two seconds and mm -hmm. for the fifties it was minutes. Like showing how the inefficiencies and the productivity. 
And that's <laughs> when we kind of try to tie that into the like, listen, guys, when we're talking about having to go faster and get down more, which we're not, we don't go to the house and grow the hard hat and do that weird stuff. We got, you got to be faster. Um, we show that in that video and it's like, this, these are ways right. to meet our thing. Right. Move so, quickly. Don't rush. Um, what's your, what's your turnover of your field team been the last year? So no pretty- one has left without being encouraged by us to leave. Okay. Um, it's been fairly low. Yeah. 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 Like, which, which means people like working for you guys, which means that they're feeling like they're growing in their career and profession, that you're treating them fairly and well, you're paying them well. So keep that in mind as well. This training thing will always be an area of your business that for most remodelers, it's like, I wish I was doing more in training. I wish I was doing more in training, but you guys are doing things. Keep, keep adding another layer or two. Keep working on your overall process for it. So that when you get a brand new carpenter that starts, you know, in April, on April 16th, 2026, you've got a nice little track that you can walk them through. So keep that kind of long-term goal in mind, but also be encouraged that, you know, you haven't had much turnover and people seems like they enjoy working for a Contento Co. Contento Co. Folks, we we got a little bit of your story. We we dug into some numbers. I think there were some takeaways for people listening to that. Gave you a little bit of feedback on the partnership, next step in hiring, how you're paying for them. Talked a little bit about training. Um, I would say mission accomplished for uh, a beautiful episode of the Remodelers on the Rise show. Allison, great. Thank you. You best, Joe. If, yes, if, there, if there was a final question or a final takeaway that you had from this, what would it be? Chris, go first and then Tim. Well, for me, it would be more the partnership into things and um actually having these partnership meetings i think that's my big thing here that we we need to really start doing that love it more about you tim and mine's uh you know i think the the numbers will follow the more we pay attention to and we gotta just keep on keep on that part of it and make sure that we don't uh don't be satisfied with what we've got and keep keep making it better keep pushing what gets measured gets improved. Keep measuring those things. Mm. Cool. And then we both have uh, in my in my office here. We've got this banner, which was from the Buffalo area, and then over uh, Tim's shoulder, there's one in your guys' office. Reminder, everybody: good work isn't cheap, and cheap work isn't good. Know your value. Charge accordingly. Watch your job costing to make sure you're realizing all of that gross profit, and continue to be remodelers on the rise. Thank you, Chris and Tim. Thanks, Doc. If you've got See you guys.